Awesome. And next we have Andrew Johnson uh, with BLM. So hello, uh, my name is Andrew Johnson. I'm a geographer for the Bureau of Land Management's Eagle Lake Field Office in Susanville, California. Uh, today I'll be discussing the use of AIM data for long-term fire treatment monitoring of the 2012 brush fire. First of all, I'd like to welcome you to the, Eagle, the Bureau of Land Management's Eagle Lake Field Office. Uh, we manage about a million acres in northeastern California and northwestern Nevada. Um, on August 12, 2012, the rush fire ignited due to a lightning strike and quickly grew to 10,000 acres. After a, a month-long campaign, it was finally controlled over 300, at 315,000 acres. Almost a third of our field office had burned. Um, so where do you even start? Uh, it's 300,000 acres of priority sage-grouse habitat, uh, important mule deer habitat, and it's all completely gone. So over the next two weeks, we worked tirelessly to develop an emergency stabilization and rehabilitation plan, also known as an ESR plan. Um, the treatment objectives were to establish a vegetative component of native species that's capable of resisting the invasion of annual grass and noxious weeds, and establishing enhancing sage-grouse habitat that provides effective cover for all life cycle stages. The three indicators uh, we selected for meeting our objectives were perennial grass, sagebrush, and annual grass cover. Uh, we identified two uh, treatments uh, that would be viable for restoration work, aerial broadcast seeding and rangeland drill seeding. Uh, we need to identify our treatment locations after that. So our aerial treatment locations were prioritized in areas that had not previously burned and with moderate to severe burn intensity. If you haven't done work in our region, it's extremely rocky. Um, so we really ended up drill seeding wherever we could get a drill seeder into. Um, overall, we aerially broadcast seed about 23,500 acres via helicopter during November and December using three different uh, seed mixes that were prepared on site. And you can see the process here. Uh, additionally, we were able to identify and clear 2,900 acres for drill seeding. We utilized two different seed mixes and even received some precipitation, but we didn't know that would be all the precipitation that we'd get that winter. Uh, in January 2013, it was the start of a three-year drought cycle. Uh, with mild winters and no snow in 2013 and 2014 um, greatly reduced the growing season water availability. Um, you can see uh, in 13 there, uh, that winter, we, we really just got nothing right after we had finished our seeding. Um, this is coupled with extreme evapotranspiration rates as well. Our monitoring design contained three strata, our aerial broadcast treatments, rangeland drill treatments, and our untreated sites. And these sites were sampled for four years in 2013, 14, 15, and 19. So our monitoring questions were, did these treatments increase perennial grass cover and sagebrush cover? And did they reduce invasive annual grass cover over time compared to our untreated sites? For the analysis methods, I used a mixed effect model with repeated measures to compare treatments while controlling for year. I also used a Kruskal Wallace to account for lack of normal distribution in 2019 seed mixes. For perennial grasses in our first graph, um, our perennial grass cover is on the y-axis and monitoring year grouped by treatment is on the x-axis. Across treatments as a whole, there's not a significant difference in the effect of treatments on perennial grass cover. But if we break out treatments by their seed mix and focus on 2019, we actually find that drill seeded Wyoming big sage sites had significantly less perennial grass cover than untreated sites. It's not very good. Uh, when we look at annual grass cover by treatment type, it's significantly higher in 2019. Um, and so compare, significantly higher in drill seed sites when compared to our 2019 control sites. It's also not very great. Um, when we've Split, further split out the treatments by their seed mixes, we can still that the, see that these drill seeded Wyoming big sage sites were largely responsible for this difference in annual grass cover in drill seeded sites. And this is likely due to these sites being an exotic, in an exotic dominated state prior to burning. Uh, this made me wonder if the drill seeding potentially caused a reduction in soil stability or if the site was just already degraded. 
So when we look at soil stability, um, in 2013, we see there is not a significant difference between Wyoming sagebrush drill seeded sites and our control sites. And th so this provides another line of evidence that these states, um, these sites were actually in an exotic annual state prior to burning. Um, Again, when we look at sagebrush cover, it kind of follows the same trend as the perennial grass cover and that these sites were not, uh, that treatment did not have effect on, on sagebrush cover over time. And so in conclusion, um, the AIMCOR methods provide multiple lines of evidence for interpreting treatment effectiveness um, in drought, exotic dominated ecological states and seed source availability were likely contributors to treatment failure. But I really think that the power of the AIM data here, in this case, is the transparency. Um, we're able to, <laughs> I, you know, we're able to clearly show the lack of effect and, and monitor that and report on, um, report on our failures, which is important for learning and, and improving from. And so having the structure of AIM uh, really provided us that opportunity. With that, I'd like to thank um, the Great Basin Institute and NatureServe, who are our partners in collecting this data. Um, and over the last um, seven years, we've had over 70 different individuals working on the ground in Northern California District uh, collecting data. Uh, I see a few of them in the room here today, which is pretty cool. And uh, I'd also like to thank the AIM team and the Hornada uh, for all of your help and the Eagle Lake Field Office ID team and staff. Thank you. <laughs> Have you seen? I don't think it's. Working. I could try and repeat it for you. <laughs> um, have you seen successful reestablishment of mule deer and grass populations? So the question is if we've seen successful reestablishment of mule deer and sage grouse habitat or populations. Um, sage grouse populations during the time have fluctuated. They definitely took a big hit after the rush fire. Um, they seem to have stabilized in the last couple of years. Um, we had a really big winter last year. I haven't seen the, the numbers for them. Mule deer uh, populations have been uh, declining over that time. We've seen an increase in um, antelope uh, populations just because of the change in habitat. But we've been also targeting um, doing different bitter brush plantings and other projects to try and increase mule deer habitat within the fire in such a large area. So thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, um, you know, it's something we think about a lot, and we've had a lot of fires since this, and this information's been really useful. To me, the takeaways are, um, in 2012, we, there were a lot of concurrent fires and not a lot of seed availability was one big challenge. And so our seed was probably not right to begin with. And so um, for us, it's really weighing the urge to do something meaningful versus the potential to you know, waste time and, and really not make a big impact. And so it's allowed us to take a step back and feel more comfortable making the decision not to treat if we don't have all of the, the things lining up, you know, in terms of seed availability, timing, um, and you know, clearances, all these things are, it's a really big um, moving complex that you gotta kinda in target. So it's, it made, it's made us feel more comfortable when the, the everything's not in line to, to make that decision to, to try and do maybe something smaller, more targeted with a higher success rate. Um, but yeah, and we have implemented that on fires uh, since the rush fire here. So thank you very much.